Due to the graphic nature of the content, Detective may not be suitable for all audiences. When a white officer takes a black life, then we protest and riot and we say black life matters. What I mean by that is we talk about Trayvon and and other young men and women who die at the hands of law enforcement. But do we ever think about the 6,000 African-Americans that lose their lives every year at the hands of maybe 5,000 African-American men and women? So when you say black lives matter, let it matter each and every day. That's why I'm so adamant. We have to take care of our own. We have to be responsible for our own. I'm Garnsey Sloan for Investigation Discovery. And this is Season 2 of Detective. True stories from behind the yellow tape. The ones you don't hear on TV. That was Gary McFadden speaking. He was a homicide detective for over 27 years. A man with a personal connection to murder which led to a long career putting away some of Charlotte's worst criminals. As we've covered throughout this podcast, Gary has gained unique perspective as an African-American police officer in a predominantly white police department. He spent his career working to solve many issues that disproportionately affected the African-American community, including the crack epidemic, gang warfare, and especially the community's backlash after a serial killer took so many of their children. Today... Gary's experience provides him with a unique perspective on the Black Lives Matter movement, especially the relationship between police departments and African-American communities. We have a problem in America. That problem is violence. Do we address violence enough as people, as groups of people? No. We only address violence after it looks like we need to address it so we can have a platform to address it. Our kids are being killed on the streets every single day. And what are we doing about it? I want you to acknowledge we got a problem in the community. You need to address it. If you don't address it, I've told you we have a problem. We are never proactive. Every time something happens, we react to it. I would say now in America, we all know there is conflict between the African-American community and law enforcement. We know that. Why? Because it's been thrown in our face over and over again over the last two years. You know, we can name the cases. But what are we doing now when there's no media hype, nothing is going on that we can march and protest about? What are we doing now? Very little. Very little. And so when we look at Trayvon Martin case, America never really learned their lesson. And you think, is it bad? Yes, it's bad. Zimmerman went beyond what he should have done. But what America didn't understand, how did it happen? And we're still looking at how did it happen. And what Zimmerman defense team did, they played America. They played us. Why? Because we were focused on one thing. Zimmerman lawyer says, we don't care about anything else happened before or after. We are going to say that during the heat of the moment and the struggle of the battle that was going on between Zimmerman And Trayvon, did Zimmerman had to defend himself because he believed that his life was going to be taken? The problem is the wordplay is different. Stand your ground. That's self-defense. Nobody looked at it that way. But when you break it down to that, say, what is stand your ground law? Now, you had people at rallies and everybody saying, bad law, remove the law, take the law off the books. Because it's great. It's politically motivated at that point. Or, you know, it's a platform for somebody to gain status in the neighborhood. Beyond the legal positioning that goes on in these high-profile cases, there's also a lot that happens behind closed doors that the public isn't immediately made aware of. In the case of Timir Rice, whose shooting was caught on camera, the responding officers were not provided with essential information that may have altered their approach. There was many failures in that case, a hundred failures. Okay, the first failure, I would say, okay, do we know where he got that gun from? The older gentleman who called 911 said that, I believe it's a toy gun. He said that in the 911 tape. Now, I'm going to take two parts of this. 
911 operator failed to provide that information to the officer. That is a mistake. That is a huge mistake. Now, the other mistake is take a time and say, hey, young man, come here for a minute. Can I talk to you? Let me see that gun. Is that a toy gun? Why don't you put that gun down? Or better yet, give it to me. Why? Because society sees you as a young black African-American male with a toy gun. You mess around and get hurt out here. That's a responsibility I would love to see. When I go and speak to people, take a little bit more responsibility in the community and things won't turn out like this case. These are the things that cause us to move a little different on traffic stop. If you happen to do these things on traffic stops, it would turn out better for both of us. Now, we're going to get the controversial conversation of, well, you all need to do this as law enforcement. You all need to do that. You're right. You're right. But we're at the table saying, some of us at the table saying, yeah, we're wrong. Yeah, we're wrong. But then everybody wants law enforcement to be held accountable. Yes, we serve the public. We should be held accountable for our actions. I think we can say that we're open to the dialogue. Cases like Trayvon and these other cases have always happened. Media, technology brings it to the forefront. We get to talk about it. America talks about it. We put it on the Internet and all. Black Life Matters has a place in America. The problem I have with Black Life Matters, with the place that they're going, you only protest when a non-African-American takes the life of a African-American or black kid. Where it angers me is the senseless violence that continues every day. Ferguson, a perfect example. You have a 70% African-American population. Who's being elected? Who's into law enforcement? If you have 70% of the votes, could somebody else be in office at that time in Ferguson? Did you believe Black Life Matters? If it did, you could demand better. But then again, I would say this. Where was the organizations in Ferguson that came forward now and protest and march and said all these things? What were you doing all the other times? Didn't Black Life Matter then? Do you have to let Michael Brown be killed before now? You have all the answers and everything. So when we talk about Black Life Matters, it's near and dear to my soul because when I'm working African-American murders, and then an African-American has committed the murder, I want you to protest about this child's death and this child's violence, because why? That mother has still lost her lives. And what I'm trying to really say is, I want the African-American community who says black life matters or black lives matter, actually take responsibility for the lives in the African-American community are also lost by the hands of African-Americans. Until we show America that that is also our concern and not just when it is taken by someone else, they're not going to take us seriously. And that's why I'm so adamant about we have to take care of our own, we have to be responsible for our own, and we need our own to be accountable for what they do in our communities. For 30 years, Gary worked to protect the city of Charlotte. But he also wanted to make sure civilians knew their rights so they could protect themselves. Now, Gary looked back at his long career as he prepared for the next step. I signed my name for 30 years. When I signed that piece of paper and I looked at 2011, 2012, I couldn't even fathom what would I look like, how would I make it, what I will be driving at that point, what would I have seen at that point. But when the 30 years came up, it was a bittersweet thing. For me, you know, I have to pack up my desk. I've watched many detectives pack their desks up for the last day, and they went out, and we had the retirement party, and we high five and we drank the Kool-Aid punch, and they're gone. And I wonder what it was going to be like. And for me, it was a very bittersweet moment. The reason that we get out in 20 or 30 years is because you reach your retirement level. So after 30 years, you can take your full benefits and ride off in the sunset. Some cities will retire with 20 years off and ride off in the sunset. I have seen people left Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department and come back and then retire. I stayed the 30 years, so I'm proud of that and happy that I stayed. And, you know, good times and bad times I signed up for, I never walked away from law enforcement. Good times, a lot of them. Bad times, I had quite a few. But I kind of signed up for it 
and I've signed up for this journey, and I feel good about it because it's an accomplishment that is not often reached. My last day on the job, I, I did wake up with unsureness. I had oatmeal from McDonald's, and I drove in, and then I actually worked on a case up until about 12 o'clock that day, making phone calls, and then I found out that um, I needed to cater my own retirement party. So I opened the room where my retirement party was going to be, and I set it up with general stuff, and I went back home, and I put on some sneakers, a pair of shorts, and a chef jacket because I I love to cook and I love the grill. So every grill master does have a chef jacket, I hope. If not, you just have an apron. So um, I grilled and fixed all the food for my retirement party. I made all the drinks, and I had, you know, dispensers and trays of food, and I delivered it to the law enforcement center, affectionately called the LEC, the law enforcement center. And then a lot of people came to say their goodbyes. A lot of people told stories. A lot of people wished me well. And then my family spoke. My wife told them, thanked them for allowing my husband to come back to her. She talked about the nights leaving home and what your bed is like when you're leaving and you don't know when your husband is coming home. And you look on TV and you see your husband night after night, day after day. But then she saw the real me when I came home and all I could do is collapse on the bed and um, eat the leftovers and still receive the phone calls and still working. And you can't go anywhere without somebody asking you for help. And she said, that's the man that I marry. I knew I was getting into it, but I didn't know what level it went to. Also at the retirement party, my children spoke, um, and they were very candid. And I think both of my daughters cried um, and telling the stories of their dad. Um, They said that, you know, you don't know what it's like to share your father with everybody. Um, You don't know what it's like to be in the school hearing good and bad about your father, you know, in the hallways, but never can react to it. Because once you react to it, then they will connect us as father and daughter. And then somebody may come and try to harm her or retaliate. So they didn't do that. Um, But they talked about the great times that we had. I was in their lives. Every time that we spent time together, it was an event. And the kids loved that, you know. But that was my retirement, and it was tough. So Gary went out with friends, family, and even some former foes turned friends surrounding him. But adjusting to being a normal person wasn't something Gary was exactly prepared for. And so then I started doing old people stuff, I guess, you know, looking at the news and looking at the weather. And then I started watching Maury Povich, you know, who's the baby daddy, and start doing all that. But I tell everybody this thing, one thing that very few people can say that they have seen, and that's a hummingbird building a nest. And I think very few people can say that. But I knew at that moment, I have watched this hummingbird build this nest. And I became intrigued with it, and I got oatmeal, and I sat there in my kitchen foyer watching a hummingbird build a nest in a tree. And then the phone rang, and then all of a sudden, it was, it was on at that moment. And I said, I have to go back to work. Gary made helping heal strange relationships a major focal point of his career. Now, in his retirement, he's made it his life's mission. I was part of creating something called Cops and Barbers. Cops and Barbers was created through a text message and one meeting at a restaurant in Charlotte. You know, we didn't have a board, we didn't have a budget, we didn't have anything. Our previous chief was named Rodney Monroe. He's from the D.C. area, Richmond, Virginia, chief of police. Very influential man. So he was getting his hair cut one day at his barber shop, and his barber, Gene Winchester, says, you know, me and a couple of guys got an idea. We've been knocking it around, but one of the guys want to bring the idea to you all and see what y'all want to do about it. Cops and Barber started off as a text message to me, and it simply said, hey, Gary, my barber wants to talk to you, him and some other guys, and can y'all put something together? Uh, He wants to work in the community. The local barbers association, the North Carolina local barbers association in Charlotte, North Carolina at that time, was being developed. I believe that were being developed. And so it simply said, can I meet with these three young men? And I met with three young men, and we had a conversation, and it was very informal. They had an idea to reach the African-American kids in their community at the level nobody reached them. 
You know, everybody gets the kids on the surface and everybody gets the kids that who they can mold into great kids with little influence or just little effort, but and it looks good at the end. So we want to go lower than that. We want to go to where we're having the arguments and discussions and, and the problems and and we're going to find out our differences. And the barbershop, if you don't know, in the African-American community, the barbershop is the focal point of all information. It is the, the best arena to argue sports. It's the political arena. If any politician comes through the barbershop and survive, they are good. No matter who your team is, every barber has their team over their barber chair. Conversations are held in the barbershop just out of a spur of a moment. Everybody goes to the barbershop. So you have this group of melting pot of men with ideas, and nobody can survive the greatest arguments in a barbershop. Once the argument stops, everybody's not going to agree with you, but everybody's not going to be against you. So you have 10 people arguing against, 10 people arguing for, and everybody getting in their chair. And what's unique about it, you leave, and somebody comes in and hears the same conversation, and then they decide what team are they going to argue with, and the arguments and the discussions continue. So it's a very beautiful, beautiful concept. And mothers, I would say, feel safe for whatever reason of leaving their sons with their barbers. It's like, I trust the barbers before I trust anybody else. As Gary has unique perspective coming from the police department, barbers have a unique perspective talking with African-American youth as they are sitting in their chairs every day. The morning are groaning about how they're being treated by law enforcement. What is being done on the streets? Why is this happening and why is it continuing to happen? Will they say this? Will they say that? Well, have you ever asked them why are they doing this? Have you ever asked them why they continue to sell drugs? Have you ever asked them why do they continue to stop me? Why are you stopping me? Why are you confronting me on the streets? Why does it seem like I'm walking down the street and you just stop me for no reason? Most people believe that we stop people for no reason. There is a reason. But they never knew that because they never knew what a roll call was, what is said at roll call. We're having multiple car break-ins during this time of hour when school kids are let out. I need for you to target those areas and stop kids and determine if they are breaking into cars. Those are conversations that happens at roll calls. Do you really know your rights? People say, yeah, I know my rights. Everybody knows I have the right to remain silent. But you go on to say this. Do you know the difference between being arrested and being detained? Do you know the difference between a custodial interview and a non-custodial interview? Do you know that I can pick up your son from the house, talk to him about any crime, he can confess to all the crimes, and I send him home, and then in a day or so, I come back and arrest him. Why do you do that? These are the conversations that we wanted to have, and these are the forums that we had. How do you get your record sponged? How do you get this wiped clean off your record? You know, can I do this? Can I vote if I'm a convicted felon? All these things people have, the barbershop answers, the street corner answers, but do they have the right answers? No, we just said that the police shoot people. So once we start having these forums, we wanted to educate. But most of all, we want to listen. Then we develop and educate. We even develop cards that we now hand out. They're called little blue cards that people, we put them out a thousand at a time. Of all of your rights on the cards, what do you do if an officer stops me? What if you do if he stops me while I'm walking? Do I have a right to walk away? Do I have a right to ask questions? But on the back of that card... If you feel like any of your rights have been violated, you feel like you have been mistreated, we give you step-by-step phone calls, emails of how to complain on officers. We tell them we do not support crooked officers. We don't like that. Why? Because it sends a bad message through the department. So we're telling you if you believe that you have been mistreated by the officer, these are the steps that you take to complain on the officer. What started as a conversation has grown into a citywide movement. Today, Cops and Barbers goes beyond the barbershops themselves and has become an institution in Charlotte. In Cops and Barbers, we have defense attorney, we have judges, we have the mayors, we have every city official come out, and they have been very much supportive. Our first Cops and Barbers, we thought that was a mistake. Um, We planned it, but we didn't have anything else in mind but getting this out and having our first event. Our first event was on Super Bowl Sunday, 2015, 
at 2 p.m. We try to w- allow people to get out of church, get something to eat, and then come over there, you know, with a full stomach. We're ready to argue and ready to have a fight. And we realized that it was Super Bowl Sunday. Um, we worried. We, we set everything up and we said nobody won't show up. We had over 250 people to arrive to our first event. All we did is say, we're going to have this event uh, called Cops and Barbers. It was brand new. Come out, have an argument with the police, tell us your gripes and your moans and everything else. And guess what? We listened. We listened. And, and it somewhat was very volatile. Some people, the first guy got up to the microphone. He said what he wanted. He came an hour early. And we can tell that he was going to be the first. And he got the microphone and he chastised us and he told us how he felt and everything. And he threw the microphone on the floor. Bam. And then everybody kind of laughed because back in um, Eddie Murphy's heyday, it was coming to America. And the pastor preached on the stage and then he threw it down and said, sexy chocolate, sexy chocolate. So it was the same thing. And we kind of, everybody kind of laughed at that the same way. But what we did that nobody knew we did before the forum. We did something untraditional, totally out of character. The chief says, I want you all to have a dinner with these young men. Now, what we did, we went, the barbers brought in the young men who didn't like the police, who had problems with the police. So the barbers identified five or six young men. So these young men have no idea what they were going to get into. So we told the barbers, we're going to have a dinner with these young men. So we found Four or five police officers, some are good with the community, some are not. Some have some reservations. And we have different backgrounds, you know, different races and everything. So we brought in different cultures of, the, of law enforcement and also with the young men, but mainly African-American young men. So my goal was to have a dinner anywhere they want to. So we went to this restaurant and we just kind of went inside. Now, I'll tell you, when I'm looking at the group, I could not distinguish a couple of officers, whether they were with the group or whether they're police officers. Because what we did is we said, come how you would go to a basketball game or a football game. Don't drive your police car, drive your car. So I never saw the cars in the parking lot, but everybody came in there, street gear, just like the other kids did. And so three officers I did not know because they were in street gear, and they finally told them they were police officers. Food brought us together. We sit down and had dinner. We had a great conversation, and then all of a sudden it got relaxed, and we start joking, and then we start talking about sports, and then we kind of ease into law enforcement about what do you all think of us, and they told us what they thought of us, and we told them what they thought of them, and it became laughter and everything, and do you all eat donuts? No, we don't eat donuts. We work out. Do you have braids? No, these are not braids. These are cornrows. What's the difference between braids, cornrows, plaits, and twists? And so one guy was explaining that just to the officer. But that conversation caught my eye because this young man was explaining the difference between plats, cornrows, and dreadlocks to this officer. Now, what we look at is, say if that young man is running with a group of young men, he goes to the store and steals something. That is the officer to arrive to the store. Even though it may be a volatile situation, will the young man disrespect the officer? I don't think so. Will the officer be able to pull a trigger and shoot that young man? I don't think so. Why? Because they don't have a conversation. They have found a bond. They took that same conversation into the forum, and we had an open forum about what they discussed. And this went down the line of other people. And so we had forum after forum after forum. And as we have in these forums, we have more people, more people, and more people. We have kids who never would go to college, got into our cadet program, through this program, and they're now in college. And so we saw where this was a vehicle. In the middle of that, we have to understand, that's February of 2015. It had gained so much attention that in July, we were invited to the White House to the 21st Century Policing Initiative by President Obama. The goal for Cops and Barbers was to reach people in the community to have open an honest dialogue so we will know what direction we really need to go in. These conversations, we believe, have never existed. I don't know how they feel. They don't know how we feel. Everybody had the answers, but nobody had the solutions. Detective is produced by Investigation Discovery and is part of the Panoply Network, with special thanks to Kevin Bennett, Amy Ancelowitz, and Emily Kaiser. This episode was produced by Tom Hina. 
Many thanks to the best audio engineer in the business, Joe Powers. Original music was composed by the talented Chris Kennedy and remixed by Joe Powers. Cover art was designed by Non Galat. Sign up now on iTunes to get new episodes of Detective on your feed and check out crimefeed.com for all your latest crime news. Thank you for joining us for this season of Detective.